Okay, hi everyone. I think we're here to discuss something quite interesting, uh, which is how does technology and gender intersect? Uh, and is there a gendered intersection? And I, th I would argue uh, that there is. And uh, I think the way women experience technology can be quite different and distinct uh, from the way men do. And there is a clear gender uh, digital divide, both in terms of uh, access to technology. Uh, there are definitely statistically proven gaps uh, in how many women and men are able to access, for example, a mobile phone or even social media platforms like Facebook and, and how many men are. And then once women are on and embracing technology, is that experience actually uh, different? And once again, it's the paradox, I think, of technology that uh, in many ways technology is able to give voices uh, and, and strength to those uh, who may not have it in regimes uh, and in societies that are controlled. Uh, but then technology used in a certain way can become its own form of intimidation uh, when it comes to women. Uh, let me quickly just uh, introduce our panel um, from left to right. Uh, we have Maggie Sprenger. Maggie is the managing director with Green Cow Venture Capital. Daniel Kayambe, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, is the founder of Grey Fire Impact. Priyanka Chaturvedi is a political leader with a major uh, regional party from India. And uh, my name is Bhad Khadat. I'm a journalist and the moderator for today. Um, let me start uh, with you, Priyanka. And I'll start with you because it's interesting for me if as cultures shift, uh, how women experience uh, technology changes as well. Um, Priyanka is somebody who recently uh, changed her political party. So she was with, with, the, with the Congress, and now she's uh, moved to a party called the Shiv Sena. And what she had to experience just for making that choice, which is her autonomous choice, she has broken no law, uh, what did get quite ugly. It wasn't just uh, public feedback. At some point, it got very personal. It got sort of borderline obscene. So speak a little bit about that. and Maybe that can become a starting point for how women uh, experience sort of technology-driven conversations. So there are two parts to this. Yeah. When I came on the platform, on social media platforms, it empowered me no end. It gave me a sense of voice and also gave me a sense of purpose. So I would say social media and especially a platform like Twitter gave me a space to be heard, express myself. And I've had very strong opinions on a lot of things and I've expressed that through uh, social media. So Twitter kind of A, it began with a tool of empowerment, a tool for getting myself heard making my opinions known in a space which is quite male dominated. So I, uh, of course that encouraged me a lot and I, uh, I, I became a part of a political party which is a national party. I know many in US would not understand the concept of jumping ship, of moving from one political party in, uh, in uh, the US. It doesn't work like that. It's a two party system. But in India there are multiple regional parties, the smaller state parties, state driven parties. And it's absolutely all right for uh, people to change political parties. And hopping uh, during the election season is the norm. But uh, that wasn't the reason why I hopped. <laughs> there are other reasons. But I saw after I changed my party, and there was a stance I took. Uh, the stance was for my own dignity, where I believe that it was being undermined at the altar of politics which I did not want because I was very clear that as a woman I've come to create a space and that space has to be honored, dignified and I should be respected for it. The backlash I got for switching parties was huge, immense and coming from sections of m women too who while they understood that okay Priyanka had issues on a, a certain incidents uh, that happened while she was uh, working there but they did not understand the need for me to move to another party. I was called overly ambitious. I was called opportunistic. I, was, I think there were just so many words used and, for and, me. And if I can interject, I mean, I think the important point to make is that you're in public life, uh, uh, and therefore there will be questions and criticism. And Absolutely. you know, we all have to not be sensitive about that. But I think your experience was very different from a man having made yes. the same choice. So, so speak to that. Right, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Men, because uh, the political parties are dominated by men, there are very uh, few women f and they're far, uh, you know, few and far between, I'd say. Uh, and just to reiterate the example of how women face more backlash than men. I was a national spokesperson of a national party and I switched parties, I faced all the backlash from my own party colleagues who till a day prior would have said I've been contributing immensely to the organization, I've been the 
I've been a fierce fighter for them, I've been a fierce voice for them. And similarly, here's a man who's also from the same party, also the national spokesperson of a party, who hopped over to another political party just two days ago. The reactions have been so different, while his uh, move has been welcomed by the own party colleagues he has left, while I was criticized, I was called an opportunistic woman who has sacrificed her ideology at the altar of reaching somewhere. So the vast difference of uh, you know reaction, even within pe pe with people who you worked with, right? I think women face more flack very clearly. So I want to link this to technology because the f that women are judged differently for ambition is a well-known fact across the globe. Uh, you know, I remember Hillary Clinton quoting Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, in an interview to me once saying that if women have to survive in public life, you have to have a skin as thick as the height of a rhinoceros. Um, but that's in the real world. And I think what we're interested, Maggie, in exploring is how that intersects with uh, technology. So I think what Priyanka said in the beginning is also important, that uh, social media does unchain you in some ways. It gives you a voice. Uh, you can particularly see this, for example, in countries like Iran, for example, uh, where uh, a resistance against an enforced uh, uh, sort of hijab uh, have seen women posting videos on Twitter. Uh, so that's their form of expression, uh, which they may not, they may be able to organize more easily online than they're able to do offline. So there is that dimension to freedom in, at one level. And then there is the fact that um, trolling uh, is often gender specific. Trolling is often female targeted. So I'm just wondering how do we get to a point where the use of technology can be gender agnostic? Maggie? Oh. <laughs> well, let me solve that for us. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think we're looking right now at how technology manifests something that is so embedded in our cultures and our societies, and, and that's really solving the gender issue in big, broad, current strokes. A lot of what I spend my time looking at is really the underlying technology and how that is attached to either reinforcing or amplifying existing cultural and social challenges. So I'm a venture capitalist. We have a firm that's based both in San Francisco and here in New York. And I spend a lot of my time working with our founding teams, specifically the CTOs, around how are you building your algorithm? Mm -hmm. And is this algorithm going to amplify unintended consequences, right? You might be a marketing company and you're leveraging your platform on social media, but the way algorithms often exist now is that they, they have an objective and they pursue that objective to all ends. And that means that whatever trends that you have in your life are going to be pursued and then exploited. And that means driving to extremism. And so I think a lot of the more the increasing divide and the increasing tensions and the problems that we're seeing here are largely unintended consequences around how we are designing these technologies. Mm -hmm. When we give an algorithm a specific objective, it pursues it to all end. If we leave it open-ended and we tell it you don't have an objective, you are simply here to work and then you need to check in, there's an opportunity to have that check-in. Right now, artificial intelligence and machine learning are these incredible tools, and we are so excited about seeing what they do, but they're also like children. And just like children, the data that we input, the patterns that we input, the way we speak to each other, are all guiding the kind of behavior it will have in the long run. And so we're at this critical junction where the data that is being mined is reflecting both our best and worst quali qualities, and it's also magnifying those. Um, so that, that's how I'm framing a lot of this conversation so that's so, so, so can I just ask you to elaborate on the inadvertent uh, use of algorithmic misogyny, uh, as it were, if, if I can frame it like that? Sure. Uh, anyone who spends time on Instagram or mm -hmm. Facebook, you know, there's that creepy feeling where you just start thinking about a product and all of a sudden it's in yes. your feed and you're going, how, how did this happen? And mm -hmm. it's because these, these algorithms are, they're both simple and they're also really, really smart. And they're looking at what your friends are doing and they're looking at how your friends search and they're looking at how you search. And the way to mobilize things, the way to feel something, what's the biggest emotion that we have as humans? It's 
fear. And to leverage that either as a fear of missing out or a fear of change or a fear of people who are different from us all comes back to very effective selling. So if I want to sell something to you on any of these platforms, I'm going to drive it to an extreme. And chances are it means reinforcing either beliefs that you already have in an even more dramatic way or using extremist language either around sexism or racism or you know culture that that give you an emotional response to the product and it can be something as casual and simple as makeup or it mm -hmm. can be something as important as a political party but whatever it is this algorithm is guiding that conversation rather than our having conversations in a room like this. And so when you're spending time on your phone or you're spending time on these platforms, you are having conversations with a machine which is helping guide how you think about mm -hmm. things. And I think if we don't take that pause and say, what are the unintended consequences of this kind of you know, mass adoption, of these platforms in this mass adoption of this way to sell mm -hmm. directly into you, it's hugely problematic. Daniel, if I can bring you into the conversation, uh, I, I don't know how it is in other cultures, but in India, uh, there has been huge resistance in pockets of the country to women actually having smartphones. And uh, you know, there's a sense that uh, a smartphone is like a private universe where a young woman can you know, assert sexuality, autonomy, uh, make her own connection. So there is a digital divide in mobile phone ownership and, and usage. And when you go into rural India, you will find women, young women will tell you that when they got a phone, their parents or their husband or their brother confiscated it and tries to control usage. And that's just one example. But like as Priyanka was saying, even when you get on and you are a user of technology, your experience can be very different from that of a man. And I, if you could just speak to that and how maybe this has played out for you personally, uh, if at all, uh, or does that only happen to women in public? You know, you have to have a big public profile to be trolled, or is, is, is sort of the an intersection between gender and technology hostile for all women? Mm. Um, wow, that's, that's big questions, <laughs> a lot of big questions. Um, yes, I think I've heard that the... Um, usage of mobile phones by women in India is actually less than yes. women in Saudi Arabia. Is that? I'm not sure about the Saudi Arabia uh, yeah. comparison, but I do know that it's, it's less than men. And I do no, know that yeah, culturally there's, uh, there is pushback in pockets of rural India, not everywhere, and it's changing. Uh, but that there is a linkage scene between assertion of independence and having a phone. Absolutely, yeah. Um, no, I, I think that there's, um, I think you see that all over the world that there, you do have countries where um, technology is used as a way to control women. Yeah. Um, I think in Saudi Arabia, they actually, there's a website where men can track the passports mm. of women in their family and prevent them from traveling or getting on airplanes um, and essentially allows them to kidnap or mm -hmm. bring women back into the country. So I think technology is, is used to control women in, in so many ways. And I think it goes, um, again, to the point that, that Maggie was making, that it technology reflects the um, biases, the of, biases of the culture that it's in. But we do live in a world where you know, these kind of binary um, beliefs uh, in, of gender are, are really prevalent. and. Um, I think that that's absolutely reflected in women's experience of technology. And one of the things I talk about quite a bit is the way that patriarchy is coded into the products that we use. So not, you know, everything from the fact that this cell phone is designed for a man to use with one hand and fit in his pocket mm -hmm. um, to um, something as innocuous as a piano, right, is actually designed for men with bigger hands than women. Uh, so there are fewer female concert pianists, for example, as a result of that. Um, to things like AI, where um, you have facial recognition um, that's not trained on women and not trained on people of color. So if you're a person of color, you're a woman, often there's a chance that if you hand your iPhone 10 mm -hmm. to someone else, 
um, that it will, they'll be able to unlock your phone. Really? Yes. So this actually happened, I was giving a talk at Yale and a woman literally uh, handed a phone to her friend and the friend was able to open the phone. Uh, so you have so many of these instances. I think one more example would be something like uh, virtual reality where um, about 25% of men experience um, a little bit of queasiness when they use it, but uh, close to 75% of women actually feel physically ill after using virtual reality. And that's because of women having a lower center of gravity than men do. So and what is happening when these products are being designed? Um, why are they not being tested on uh, women? Uh, is it because these companies are male-led? Is it, is it because men are in positions of decision making? Or is it, as Priyanka mentioned, in a different context, and I, like to, I have this thought that both misogyny and feminism can be gender neutral? I mean, women and men are products of the same patriarchy in a way. Why is this happening? Why, why is the iPhone 10 not tested on women before it's put in the market, do you think? Well, because I think that you design for yourself, right? Everyone designs for themselves, right? If you are going to build something, you design for what you know. And men are often surrounded by other men, and whether it's professional settings or... Uh, and so men use, when they design, they use themselves as the unit of measurement. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you see women design things, right, women design for women, right, because, um, and I think one thing I talk about is that because women live in this world that is built for men, um, we experience all these pain points. And essentially those are all data points that mm -hmm. can be used to design things better. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there are a lot of companies now that are being founded by female entrepreneurs that are building things differently and are building things for women and the way women experience things. Um, but I think, yes, um, having more um, founders or entrepreneurs or designers will absolutely lead to products and services that are more inclusive mm -hmm. and that actually meet the needs of mm -hmm. more people. Um, but yeah, I think that there's inherent um, inherent bias, um, not just in the way that you experience something, but I think really rooted into just about everything that we interact with, but es yeah. especially tech. That's uh, fascinating, uh, Daniel. Priyanka, talk about the paradox a little more deeply, uh, because you started by saying that in some ways, it, it, you know, you did get a voice via technology that you didn't maybe feel that you had before. Uh, but then as you're using that voice more and more, I think something that really threatens society is women using that voice. And so if, you're, you know, if you are opinionated and if your opinion may not conform to that dominant narrative of the time, then there's a huge, uh, I mean, I would almost call it a virtual uh, lynch mob that will come after you and say, why do you think this and how can you think this? And so exactly. talk a little bit about that paradox of it both setting you free and then chaining you in different in a in a different way or shackling you. I think, you in a I think way. it has a lot to do with mental conditioning that you and uh, mostly I've seen this in male-dominated societies, patriarchal societies, how women react at home or how women if some women choose to take some decisions. For instance, even entering politics for me was a huge uh, challenge when I chose to get into this space where. Nobody from my family was a part of it. It was a huge challenge back home to even uh, stand firm on my decision. So what happens at home is uh, something that you see happen on online too, where people absolutely unconnected to you are reading what you're saying, and they feel it's absolutely all right to be nasty to her, to silence her, to ask her to shut up, and use all kinds of words. And the words that are used are usually words that uh, uh, slander you, yeah. uh, uh, you know, it's about ca character assassination because it, it's the easiest for a woman to get riled upon. And there's you know, always a sexual innuendo to abu gender, absolutely. abuse is gendered online. Ab and, totally. And, and it's, a, it's a way to silence a woman. A woman chooses to retract, then choosing to fight. And uh, Twitter statistics also show that, that many women go offline or they don't talk about politics, they choose not to talk because, simply because it attracts a lot more trolling because men have this feeling that they understand the political landscape better, they understand world affairs better, they understand global politics better, and what do you know? Mm -hmm. And how can you have an opinion which is as strong as this? So 
for me it worked reverse the more they trolled me the more i said i'm not going to see this space this is mine and again even making my political career choices it has to it 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 became a, a moment for me to decide that why should i not put my ambition first at a point when i have given 10 years mm -hmm. to this space and created a space for myself why should i cede it yeah and why should i cede it for some other male coming and taking that space also yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I just, let's reverse it for a bit and talk about uh, movements on technology that have actually been pro-women. Uh, the Me Too movement uh, may have been born of two or three very famous women coming and speaking about Harvey Weinstein. Uh, but in then they became these Facebook and Twitter-led um, sort of conversations. Uh, Maggie, if I can bring you in on that. So there is a paradox here because, you know, um, in, in, in many ways the inequality offline is also so real uh, that technology can function, as I've been arguing, as that liberator and sort of uh, oppressor in the same moment in different ways. So, the, you know, we've been talking about very negative things. And the truth is, I think technology has huge potential to help address this. Uh, one of the ways that I'm approaching it is Look, all capital has impact, right? So as an investor, the things into which I put money are going to drive and affect change no mm -hmm. matter how they operate in the yeah. world. And the really awesome thing in my world right now is that we are looking at team formation. We know that if we invest into a team that has a woman co-founder on the executive team, that company is 63% more likely to outperform an all-male team. Whoa. If you have a company in the top quartile for mm. diversity, you know, we're talking about inclusion, mm. it, it goes beyond gender. Top quartile for inclusion it is going to be 63% or 34% uh, more likely to outperform than the median industry standard. Numbers like that help me have really meaningful conversations with my partners, my limited partners, the investors into our funds. Because I can say, we have an opportunity to increase the amount of money you're going to make by doing what we perceive to also be the right thing. And so we can proactively look for teams that are going to design a product that you know can fit Danielle's hand and mine. Mm -hmm. We can look for teams that are going to design things that are going to be approachable for the other 50% of the world. Because by expanding that consumer base, by expanding that user base, there's, that company is going to win. And it makes sense, because when you are having a conversation about how to design a piano and how big those keys should be, if you have multiple viewpoints in the room, you're going to design a better piano. Um, so I, I think this is something that all makes sense about how we need to be thinking, how we need to be restructuring um, team formation and, and the companies mm -hmm. and how to attract a company culture that will be more inclusive. Um, and, you know, and I was just saying that, I mean, this is uh, an all-female panel, uh, but the fact is that we're talking about something gendered, but there are many other uh, panels which are manals, and we've started seeing pushback against against that slowly. So my question, Daniel, to you would be that when you go out and talk about how the iPhone 10 has been designed, keeping men in mind, designed by men for men, essentially, is what you're saying. Uh, what is the response of these, you know, these, these big companies? Because surely this is a conversation that has started. And have you seen change flow from your pointing these examples out? Um, so I wrote an article um, about essentially this topic. Um, and a lot of people read it. And I think that that um, started to really kind of shift the narrative. Because I think fundamentally, you know, women are 85% or influence or drive 85% of consumer purchasing. Um, but women only receive 2% of funding for new innovation. So that means that men are responsible for 98% <laughs> of the new products and services that you're getting access to, but they're designing for a consumer base that's almost exclusively women. Like, how does that make mm -hmm. any sense? Yeah. You know, so I think that there's, there's such a disconnect there. And I think from my perspective, you know, there's no loyalty, right? Fundamentally, like all of these brands and companies 
are building things that probably have very low loyalty, right? So if you're a woman and you've been kind of using these poorly designed products for years and someone comes, a, wom a woman comes along and builds something that actually meets your needs, you're going to give them all of your money, right? Uh, so I think that it's, it's in companies' best interests and investors' best interests to, um, to figure out how to address, mm -hmm. address this imbalance. Um, because women are essentially the most powerful, um, I think the most powerful consumer base. And we influence, I think the thing that's quite interesting is that we influence, um, we purchase for the whole family, typically. So we're buying for our children, we're buying for our partners, we're buying for our parents, right? Because women are also caregivers for you know, aunts and uncles or aging parents. So women are having, having a dedicated female customer is much more valuable to a company um, than, any, than having even one man, right? Who essentially just purchases for himself. But then, uh, you know, by the logic of the market, this should have changed because well, the market is. The, who said men say that the market is logical and clearly, <laughs> right? That it's fully. It's, I mean, it's clearly illogical. So, uh, Maggie, you're still being more optimistic about about what technology can do. And where does your optimism spring from? I see companies out there that are doing incredible things. We were talking about India earlier, and this disparity between access to smartphones yeah. and, and data and information, and yet we're seeing change in places too. I'm sure you're familiar with Misho. Um, for those not, it's a reseller platform. It was developed in India. It's taken off very dramatically. It was actually Facebook's first investment into India, and it gives women the opportunity to have their own small marketplaces online and sell things. and. Yeah. It's really significant because in some areas, just through the reseller platform, women are able to increase their household income by 30 to 50 percent. That's changing the conversations in those households. And as that power is shifting, other women peripherally who maybe are not able to access information on mm -hmm. their phone, there's a motivation to let them access information on the phone. This isn't a perfect system. This isn't going to overnight fix a problem that is massive and pervasive, but it's an opportunity to start a conversation. That's the kind of thing that keeps me excited and hopeful, mm -hmm. even as we are facing you know, a laundry list of issues. Sure, Priyanka, you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm quite in agreement with what Maggie is saying. Like, when I began uh, speaking on this particular subject, I said technology has empowered many women and given them voices which were till, not, uh, till now not heard. And as far as even businesses are concerned, the small businesses, India is seeing a fundamental change in those spaces as well. Women who were earlier sitting at home had ideas to implement. They could execute those ideas into business ideas. We've seen many such success stories at a smaller level, but they're doing very well using these uh, 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 very social media platforms that are also used to troll. So that's the paradox of uh, social yeah. media, how you're seeing it, from which prism you're seeing it, and how you build on it are the conversations that we must be having, we should be having. So, so le let me open this up. It'd be interesting, a lot of young women in the room, what has been your experience, your interface with technology? Is it something where you feel yourself? Uh, there's also a dimension we haven't spoken about, which is that essentially uh, a lot of social media has made us into a society of voyeurs and exhibitionists. Uh, is there more pressure, uh, you know, is that pressure much more on women? Uh, sort of the, the, the image and myth making that, that, that arises out of this. I can see a lot of young women kind of nodding. Yes, can we? That was very insightful. Thanks a lot. Um, I work in cybersecurity, and you know, they're the women in tech, but especially cyber, they're just so few. And I think that speaks to a lot why these products are just not designed for women. There's just no <laughs> women in the room. Mm -hmm. But you, I do advocate a lot. You know, I work. Uh, I went through a nonprofit uh, sector myself to get into cybersecurity. I speak on their behalf a lot to young women. Uh, you know, in the Bronx and Harlem to get into tech to start coding, no matter what your age is. And it's such a huge field. But uh, do you see changing? You know, because there there is such a need for 
there, in, in, there's a huge gap in U.S. especially for tech jobs. There's more jobs than people. And it's a great opportunity, I think, for a lot of women to get into tech. I did as an immigrant. You know, I, I, found, I, found, I found great success. And did you face, before I get the panel to respond yes. to that, did you face push, what was the kind of pushback you faced initially? Absolutely. I went through a tech uh, program where I was pregnant and deciding to start a career in cybersecurity. And a lot of people said, I don't know if you should be doing that. But I thought, well, there's doctors and engineers who also get, you know, have families. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I did that. And I had a lot of support from my family, of course, that helped. But yeah, it was a decision that, you know, I'm very proud of. And I hope my daughter is too. But there was definitely pushback where people were saying, you're four months pregnant and you're considering cybersecurity career. I don't know if that's a good choice. But yeah, there are these barriers. You know, they, they, were, they thought that they were trying to help. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, but not. Uh, yeah. I think I find it really interesting because I think women essentially pioneered technology. So women were essentially the earliest computers. Um, when you look at things like keyboards and I think even kind of the initial original like design of the most basic computer was based on like the switchboard operators um, and how women like which were run by women right and the system that they have I think is what influenced how things are coded right so. Um, you know, I think it's these narratives are have been created by men who control a lot of the media and the myth making. And I think I think a couple of years ago I was reading something and someone had dug up like the original photo of the Apple founders and it's been cropped so that the women aren't there. There are women in the photo, but they're cropped out. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, so much of I think part of our responsibility now as a society is to start to rewrite some of those narratives um, because women have been, you know, active in everything, right? Like every aspect of the world, every aspect of technology. And I think in order to start to kind of find those balances, we have to change the stories and change the, the expectations and the images that are in people's mind. Very interesting conversation. The next time uh, uh, we would like to see men on, a con on this panel as well, just like we'd like to see more of us on conversations that are not about gender. Uh, thank you very much to our panel. A big round of applause. And thank you for being a great audience.